Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the Correct Views. Sam I. B. DeGangi reporting for the Media Speaks. Uh, as always, the ever unreliable Google has made it so that there is no live broadcast at this time in the way that there is supposed to be. So we're going to go ahead and simply go with it in HDEF because I can rely on me. I simply can't rely on Google. Um, this is uh, disturbing news. As always, Ebola news, by the way, coming at the end. We will be doing Ebola here until it is no longer a threat to us here in North America. But I'm not going to lead with it because I don't want to end up uh, boring all the people that are not following it. So there will be Ebola updates on every show until we're risk-free for the foreseeable future. Infowars.com, they just want the money. The IRS can now seize control of accounts on suspicion alone. Um, I stand corrected. It's not Infowars. It's actually Zero Hedge. They are on Infowars as a link. How can this happen, Miss Hinders said in a recent interview. Who takes your money before they prove that you've done anything wrong with it? The federal government does. The topic of civil asset forfeiture has been high on our agenda recently as federal agents discover how to steal Americans' hard-earned cash with zero repercussions, there are links for all of this, and decide unilaterally how much cash a common man is allowed to carry. Now, I'm sorry, does it say anywhere in the Constitution at all that there is allowed to be a, um, an amount that you are allowed to carry? Where it says the New York Times reports the escalation of the IRS brings a whole new world of possibilities with regard to asset confiscation based on no actual crime being proved. Now let's pause for a second. You might be saying to yourself, why, why would an average citizen carry this kind of money on them? Why? I mean, obviously, it's not such a bright idea. They must be involved in drugs or something. Okay. Let me tell you this. I do not sell drugs. Not because I think the government has any business in telling me what it is that I should and shouldn't do and what I shouldn't sell. I don't sell drugs because really selling anything, people always coming to you complaining about whatever it is that you sell. The weed was too strong. The weed was too weak. Uh, you, you're not ghetto enough, I don't want to buy off you. What I can't deal with it. Even if it was legal, I really don't think I could deal with it. I'm just being honest. My problem with it is I am someone who refuses to bank. Are you like that? I hope you are. If you don't know how to do that, go to themediaspeaks.com, look up how to live without banks, and uh, it will tell you how to do that. It's by far and away uh, one of the two most popular things that I've ever written and ever posted online. I don't bank. I won't and don't. Well, how do I buy anything? Like, uh, say I want to buy some gold. What I do is I take my money and I take it to the convenience store and I get money orders. Money orders I then use to buy whatever it is that I was trying to buy and didn't want to use a credit card for because I don't bank and won't bank. Well, if a cop was to pull me over on the way to the convenience store and say I was going to buy an ounce of gold for $1,200 plus, I'm one of those people making a perfectly legal transaction, a perfectly legal purchase of gold from a perfectly legal institution. That I've done. I've done it. Want to know what else I've done? I'm a musician in the band Passing Time. See you at George's Lounge, Canton, Ohio, Halloween night. Um, I have gone and driven way in the middle of nowhere to a guitar center to buy the Korg that I use. Um, they had it refurbished, and I bought it. And I was carrying over $700 in mostly ones, because I work for tips. I'm a DJ. All the way there. Case number two. So don't tell me that people don't do this every day when I do it all the time. Perfectly innocent people doing perfectly legal maneuvers. For almost 40 years, Carol Hinders, it says, has dished out Mexican specialties in her modest cash-only restaurant. For just as long, she deposited the earnings at a small bank branch a block away until last year 
when two tax agents knocked on her door and informed her that they had seized her checking account almost $33,000. Don't want this to happen to you. One more time. How to live without banks on TheMediaSpeaks.com. The Internal Revenue Service agents did not accuse Mrs. Hinders of money laundering or cheating on her taxes. In fact, she was not been charged with any crime. Instead, the money was seized solely because she had deposited less than 10 grand at a time, which was viewed as an attempt to avoid triggering a required government report. So, what they're saying is they can go after you if you put in over 10 grand. But since they made that arbitrary number up, if you put in less than 10 grand, then you also could be suspect because you're changing it. Maybe it was really 13 grand, but you're adding it to the next quarter to avoid it. So whether you do or don't put 10 grand in, you're screwed. Are you following me here? That is why you need to live without banks like I proudly do. Her money was seized under an increasingly controversial area of law known as civil asset forfeiture. Uh, look up the Fourth Amendment, that means there should be no such thing, which allows law enforcement agents to take property that they suspect of being tied to crime even if no criminal charges are filed. That means no due process of law for Sam going to buy his keyboard. Law enforcement agencies get to keep a share of whatever is forfeited. So if I get uh, pulled over and the cops take the money off me and I beat them with the said keyboard, I'm a criminal. Critics say, a joke, the critics say this incentive has led to the creation of a law enforcement dragnet with more than 100 multi-agency task forces combining through bank, combing through banks, looking for bank accounts to seize. Still want to put your money in a bank? Using a law designed to catch drug traffickers, racketeers, and terrorists by tracking their cash, the government has gone after run-of-the-mill business owners and wage earners without so much as an allegation that they have committed any serious crimes. The government can take the money without ever filing a police complaint, a criminal complaint, and the owners are left to prove their innocence. Many just give up. They lose their money. Sam doesn't get his keyboard to follow the analogy. They're going after people who are really not criminals, said David Smith, a former federal prosecutor who is now a forfeiture expert and lawyer in Virginia. They're middle-class citizens who have never had any trouble with the law. On Thursday, in response to questions from the New York Times, the IRS announced that it would curtail the practice, focusing instead on cases where the money is believed to have been acquired illegally or a seizure is deemed justified by exceptional circumstances. So basically, if you put 10 grand in a bank, then you have to claim it as if you did something wrong. And if you don't put 10 grand in, they might decide that you could have put 10 grand in and nail you anyway. That's why I don't. And we'll bank. Um, you, think it's, you think it's rare? You think it's just one story? Oh, Sam, you don't give any sources. The hell I don't. Liberty, Brits, Krieg, Michael Krieger. Common people do not carry this much U.S. currency. This is how police justify stealing American citizens' money. Police confiscating Americans' hard-earned cash as well as a wide variety of other valuables without an arrest or conviction is a disturbing and growing practice throughout these United States. It says... Since cops get to keep the seized funds and use the money on pretty much anything that they want, the practice is becoming endemic in certain parts of the nation. The theft is referred to, once again, as civil forfeiture or civil asset forfeiture. Incredibly, under civilian forfeiture laws, your property is incredibly guilty until you prove it innocent. Doesn't that seem a little backwards to you, or are you so busy listening to talentless people like Beyonce that you're not paying attention anymore? The extent of the problem came to my attention, it says, last summer after reading an excellent article by Sarah Stillman in The New Yorker. 
The article struck such a chord with me, I penned a most highlighting it and addressing the issue titled, Why You Should Never Ever Drive Through Tenaha, Texas. We covered that on the show. That article ended up being one of my most popular posts of 2013, and it should have been. Fast forward a year, and many mainstream publications have also jumped on the topic. Most notably, the Washington Post published an excellent article last month titled, See... Tight, last month, titled Stop and Seize, which I strongly suggest reading if you haven't already. Fortunately for us, the issue is all caught the eye in the always hilarious John Oliver of Last Week Tonight. Never heard of it, but whatever. The following clip from the show is brilliant. Not only is it hilarious, but it will hopefully educate a wider audience about the insidious practice so that it can be stopped once and for all. Basically, a cop says that common people do not carry this much U.S. currency. So it's somehow up to the cop to decide whether or not you have a Fourth Amendment right. If you're angry about that, then good. Share this video. Let other people know that it's going on. That's why I am out here. Friends, I got a couple stories here that are really interesting before we get into the Ebola and the dumdies dumb of the day, one of which is not Ebola related. Um, I got too many stories uh, on the science information. For those of you that don't know, um, once a week at TheMediaSpeaks.com, Saturday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I go on air and I have a segment on there called News from the Science Front. Well, I've gotten so many science stories that I can't get to there, even doing two at a time, that I'm going to go ahead and do two of them here. And I think a lot of you are going to find it interesting, so don't zone out, because I think most people, for instance, love or know someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia. Well, we already know that coconut oil can help its symptoms. It cannot cure the disease. People that say that, cure, that it cures it are overstating the case. Well, we've got some new news here. New insight, Alzheimer's disease linked to penal gland calcification from fluoride. So let's pretend that fluoride really does help your teeth the way that it says that it does, which we know that it does not. Are you willing to give up your chompers? Really, are you going to give up your teeth in order you're going to save your teeth, I should say, in order to give up your mind. To not know who your own sister, brother, cousin, mother, father is. Really? It looks like fluoride is leading to a lot of this. This is written by Christina Sarich, Infowars.com. Alzheimer's disease is running rampant throughout the modern world now. But even with pharmaceutical companies spending billions on drugs to cure it, in parentheses, th in quotes, they have failed miserably. While the use of coconut oil for Alzheimer's disease is proving beyond beneficial, the answer to really treating this disease may lie in the penal gland in the decalcification of the most important elements of the endocrine system. I want to add real quick that never ever cooking on Teflon, staying away from heated aluminum, is pivotal in not getting this disease. Uh, more from the article. For the past few decades, research into treating Alzheimer's disease has been relegated to an assumption that it is caused by a lack of the neurotransmitter acesclorine, it's A-C-E-T-L-O-C-H-O-L-I-N-E. -E. In fact, most pharmaceuticals made to treat Alzheimer's patients are, in fact, acetecholines inhibitors. Oh, wait. I'm so great with these words acetecholesterase inhibitors, drugs that inhibit the enzyme that blocks the neurotransmitter down. Again, I'm not a doctor, but I can read what they write, at least kind of. Big Pharma fails to treat Alzheimer's. These drugs have produced only palliative results. That means uh, not worthless, not groundbreaking. If any, and many of these cause seizures and other neurological issues in the patients who take them. As Sawyer Jai, J.I. from Green Med Info on, uh, so cunning, convincingly points out, Alzheimer's drugs are nothing but patented zeobiotic chemicals, completely alien to the human's physiology. So in this case, it makes sense to look deeper into the cause of such a prevalent disease. 
Again, one of the cures might be in prevention itself. Despite failed trials, big pharma, big pharma, all the companies that are trying to sell you things all the time to, uh, you know, cure your liver by giving you cancer. You've all, how many of you have seen? This may help with your depression, and it may lead to thoughts of suicide, heart disease, cancer. Who would take this drug? Why well, even they can't cure it. Says, for instance, trials of Eli Lilly's gamma secretase inhibitor, uh, it's LY450139, were halted due to below par results, worse than they expected. Later, despite reports that results of solazimab, a neuroprotector that binds to plaque and inhibits its formation, were positive. The company said that it was not going to the FDA for approval, but will conduct a third phase trial. The company has already failed three times in creating the inhibitor that would address the disease effectively. That means by the time it finally does come out, it'll be so expensive that nobody can get it. In 2011, Bristol Myers uh, Squibb tried to develop a gamma secretase inhibitor. In 2012, Pfizer announced that it was abandoning further development of it, and in 2013, Baxter International reported that its immune-bolstering treatment had ended in a failure. Well, it says the research reveals a link between calcification of the brain and Alzheimer's disease. So don't zone out on me. What does that mean to you? How does that affect you trying to make sure that maybe you're not one of the people that get Alzheimer's? The new study looks at intracranial calcifications in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. After noticing that the brain's primary structures were negatively affected by calcification, namely the penile gland, hebnula chlorides, plexus, superior sagittal sinus, basal ganglia, flux, delma meter, and tenderorium cerebelli, as well as the petroxylenoid ligaments, a promising new hypothesis was formed. For those of you that uh, say that there are not real science behind that, you go ahead and pronounce them better than I did. What's it mean in English? That's why you tuned in. You can't really do a, um, a test on an Alzheimer's brain until the patient is deceased. And they're finding that there are different parts in the brain and the sinus area that show a certain number of these formations. And if you don't have them, then there's a real good chance that you won't ever develop Alzheimer's. How's that for English terms? Removing calcification from the brain could treat the disease. Yeah, Christelle is laughing. I don't know how to pronounce the words, but I know what the words mean. Alzheimer's patients had highly calcified penal glands and do two-thirds of the adult population. And a likely cause of the calcification is fluoride. Fluoride is likely to cause decreased melatonin. I take melatonin to sleep, so that's good news for me and you that do so. Production and have other effects on national penal function, which is part could turn into a contributing factor to a variety of effects on humans. In other words, we have yet another reason to avoid fluoride. It says also um, reduce uh, halides. They come in the form of fluoride, chlorine, and bromide. Uh, remove pesticides, fungicides, and mercury. Only purchase organic or non-GMO foods. Yeah, if you're rich. The GMO producers are part of the problem by overcharging. They, they are really forcing us to buy less healthy foods. I hate GMOs, but the organic producers are some greedy bastards. Cease the use of sugar, caffeine, and alcohol. Reduce refined starches. Reduce stress. Stop smoking. How many things have to come up before you people quit smoking? Um, again, I, I, if there was such a thing as a social smoker, that would be me. If someone lights a black and mild or a clove, I will do a hit or two, but I buy cigarettes. Drugs like cocaine and heroin, obviously. Eat raw cocoa or dark chocolate, that's good news. 
Consumer neem extract is uh, reducedly very good. Reduce meat, reduce meat and dairy consumption. That's hard to do. And reduce acidic beverages like soda and energy drinks. Soda proving again and again to be like the toxin of death. All right, we're going to go ahead. We've got how many minutes? 11. All right, we're going to do one more news from the science front here before we get into the Ebola. ScientificAmerican.com, the Epstein-Barr virus wears chain mail. Don't tune out. Don't zone out. This is going to affect you. Uh, calling all D&D &D fans, I guess. It looks like this virus is wearing chain mail to prevent drugs from working. I wish that I could show you the picture of this thing. The Epstein-Barr virus and its relatives in the herpes virus family are known for their longevity. They persist in host tissues for years, causing diseases like mononucleosis, the kissing disease, Kaposi's sarcoma, and herpes, we all know what that is, and are notoriously difficult to kill. University of Cali, Los Angeles biophysicist Zi Hung Zhao thinks the secret to the herpes virus's resilience may be the layer of microscopic chain mail. You can't make this stuff up, friends. Zhao and his colleagues examined the outer shells, or capsids, of the primate herpes virus under an electron microscope and saw a pattern of, of interlocking protein rings. These rings form a mesh that can withstand intense pressures and explain why the herpes viruses can contain, maintain decades-long infections. In the study, it was the link here for it at Scientific American, published October 7, issue of Structure, marks the first time anyone has been able to bring the herpes virus structure into focus, literally. In other words, one of the reasons that it is so prevalent in our society isn't just uh, sexual promiscuity, but it also has to do with um, the nightmare that is the way it's set up. Viruses are resistant to drugs for these reasons, so hopefully we'll find drugs that are able to defeat the defense but you have to wonder at the end of the day if maybe uh, the virus is so strong that the drugs that kill it are going to end up hurting us, you, me. Well, I don't have herpes, but you get the point. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Uh, do me a favor. Go to the Arcadia Grill because if you happen to go down there, you're going to find some of the best food that you have ever, ever eaten. And you're going to be enjoying it quickly. They've got some of the best ravioli I've ever eaten. Go to the bar. They'll make you some of the best drinks you've ever enjoyed. So do me a favor, friends. Check it out. Let them know that you heard about it from the correct views. Likewise, if you're going to Cedar Point this year, you may want to check out the Seacrest Motel. Now, you've only got one weekend to do it. Halloween is almost here. It's the last weekend. We're open till the 1st. Cedar Point's going to be open. And if you're going there for the haunted houses and you're going there for all the cool things that are happening, you're going to need some place to stay. And you're going to want to stay at the Seacrest Motel because instead of paying between $100 and $600 for a room, they're going to give it to you at a fraction of the price. They're even going to beat like the microtels. Where? The Seacrest Motel. And you can find out all about them by going to the Seacrest Motel. Just tell Vicky you heard about it from TCV, the correct views. All right, guys, that brings us into the Ebola update. For those of you that tuned in for it, it looks like it's going to be a two-part show. Just go ahead and click on the uh, part two of this, and you will get your whole Ebola update. Also, don't tune out because... It's brought to you by Neopa Radio. Neopa Radio, putting the correct views into syndication. Ebola can survive on surfaces for almost two months. Tests reveal certain strains can survive for weeks when stored at low temperatures. This is absolutely horrible news. Um, but it's news that you need to know, especially if you're somebody watching this who might be a doctor or a nurse or a healthcare specialist that obviously, according to our own government, has not trained you properly. The number of confirmed Ebola cases passed the 10,000 mark over the weekend despite efforts to curb its spread. 
And while the disease typically dies on surfaces within hours, research has discovered it can survive for more than seven weeks under certain conditions. During tests, the UK's Defense Science and Technology Laboratory found that the Zaire, the Zaire strain will live on samples stored on glass at low temperatures for as long as 50 days. So much for Obama saying you can't catch it on a bus. The tests were literally carried out by researchers from DSTL before the current outbreak in 2010. But the strain investigated is one of five that is still infecting people globally. The findings are also quoted in advice from the Public Agency of Health in Canada. Ebola was discovered in 1976 and is a member of the Flavoridae family. Uh, that is not entirely true. I wish to uh, correct the Daily Mail. Look up Ebola Athens uh, outbreak. It's very likely that ancient Athens was in fact wiped out by Ebola. How? Because it infected the city and they didn't contain it properly, just like Obama is it now. And it wiped out a huge section of Athens. Uh, chronic bleeding, chronic hiccuping, all of that. It's um, It was Ebola that wiped out ancient Athens. So don't let them tell you that it was discovered in 79. It was... It was discovered, and then once they found out what it was, they realized that it had, in fact, infected ancient Athens. So, no, it was not created by the government. It may have been altered by various governments, but it was not created by the government. That is a lie. This family includes the Zaire Ebola virus, which was first identified in 76, as I just said, that is not true, and is the most virulent. That is true. Sudan Ebola virus, Thai forest Ebola virus, and uh, many different kinds. It goes on and on, and you can read the article. For the 2010 paper, The Survival of Filoviruses in Liquids, the solid substrates in the dynamic aerosol that is airborne, Sophie Smither and her colleagues tested two particular flavor viruses on a variety of surfaces. These were the Lake Victoria Marburg virus and Zebolf. Uh, Marburg is very close to Ebola. It's in the same family, and it's just as bad, if not worse. Each was placed into a guinea pig tissue samples and tested for their ability to survive in different liquids and on different surfaces at different temperatures over a 50-day period. When stored at 4 degrees, that is 39 degrees Fahrenheit by day, 26 viruses from three of the samples were successfully extracted. In other words, if, you, if you're anywhere near a non-tropical uh, desert kind of environment, it tends to be able to live in colder environments. It tends to be more airborne in colder environments. And by colder, I mean like under uh, 75 are you ready, friends? Are you ready? Because the correct views has been correct on this. Since May, I have caught, I have caught, I have caught BS. I have had idiots calling me out. And you know what? You boneheads are wrong. And I was right. CDC finally admits that Ebola can float through the air three feet. I am so sick of people arguing with me when I look this up and they feel the need to try to call me out like I don't do this every day. It pisses me the hell off. Washington's blog, October 27th, 2014. We've noted, as Sam noted in May, by reading a study that came out in 1989. For some time, Ebola can be spread by aerosols to frontline healthcare workers. The CDC is finally admitting this fact. The CDC has put out a new poster stating this. Uh, Christelle, go ahead and change the card. We are going into part two. Nobody is going to miss a word. I'm pausing here. Go to part two.